Welcome back. Thanks for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. We are up to episode 181 and Luke chapter 8. And I would encourage you to read through your copy of Luke 8 at home. And here's my personal summary of it. Jesus kept traveling from town to town, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And the 12 disciples were with him along with some women whom Jesus had driven demons out of. Specifically mentioned here are Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna. These women are, were financially supporting Jesus' ministry, actually, at this time. Uh, Jesus told a large crowd a parable about a farmer scattering seed. Some of the seed fell on a path and birds came and ate it. Some fell on rocky ground, but the plants died due to dehydration. Some fell on thorny soil, which grew and choked the plants out. And other seed fell on good soil and produced a miraculously good crop, like a hundred times what was sown. The disciples asked what the parable meant, and Jesus responded that he spoke in parables because those who refuse to listen to the truth don't even deserve to have it told to them. Jesus explains the parable by saying that the seed on the path are those that hear the word of God, uh, but Satan immediately takes it away from them. So it never actually uh, is taken to heart, really. Jesus, uh, Jesus also goes on to explain that the seed that is falling on rocky ground are those who receive the word of God with joy and emotion, but when their faith is actually tested, they fall away because they have no root, or not a deep root anyways. The seed that is falling among the thorns are those who receive the word of God, but they don't mature because they get too consumed with life's worries uh, and its riches and its pleasures and just too consumed with this life and competing priorities in life in general. We'll talk more about this in a, in a couple minutes. But the seed on good soil is those who have a good heart, who hear the word, receive it, and it produces a crop. Jesus goes on to say that it would be insane to light a lamp and then hide it because the nature of a lamp is that you put it out in the open. Those who demonstrate faith will actually receive even more. A, as Jesus was teaching, his biological family comes to visit him and somebody alerted him to that fact. But Jesus responded that uh, by saying that anybody who hears the word of God and puts it into practice, that's his real family. He says <laughs> culturally controversial stuff like that all the time. Uh, on another day, Jesus told his disciples he wanted to go to the other side of the lake. So they did. And as they were traveling, he fell asleep and a sudden storm threatened the boat. The disciples woke Jesus in panic and yelled that they were going to drown. And Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the waves. The storm stopped and he asked his disciples where their faith was. And they were amazed and terrified at the same time. And they asked one another who this Jesus really was, if even nature submits to him. A demon-possessed man who lived in the region of the Gerasenes, which is like southeast of the Sea of Galilee, approximately, came to Jesus and cried at his feet, asking, what, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you not to torture me. The demon had seized this man many times and driven him into a, a solitary living state. The demons, who called themselves legion, which means thousands, uh, begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. So Jesus sent them, uh, the demons, into a herd of pigs on the hillside, and the pigs rushed down the bank into the lake. The people later saw the man from whom the demons, demons were driven sitting at Jesus' feet and in his right mind, and the people of the town asked Jesus to leave as this had all hurt their economy, the, the pigs all getting ruined, and they were afraid of Jesus' power. The man who was demon-possessed wanted to travel with Jesus, but Jesus told him to go back home and tell everybody else what God had done for him. That's interesting, too, because oftentimes Jesus says, don't tell everybody, mm -hmm. uh, usually in his ministry around Jerusalem. But here in a different region, he says, nope, I want you to be an evangelist for me. Go and tell a synagogue ruler named Jairus sent for Jesus because his daughter was sick and dying. Jesus was on his way, but a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years touched him discreetly in a crowd. And Jesus sensed that this power had gone out from him, and he asked who it was. Peter, uh, meanwhile, is trying to get Jesus to keep moving on. Uh, but Jesus insisted that he figure out who this was, and the woman eventually who touched him came forward. Jesus assured the woman that her faith had healed her. And someone at that moment came from Jairus' house and told Jesus to not bother coming any further because the daughter had died. Jesus went to Jairus' house anyways, though, and he said the girl was only asleep. And people started laughing at the comment, probably just like hysterically. Jesus 
Entering the, the girl's room with Peter, James, and John and her parents took the girl by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned to her and she got up and she ate and everyone was astonished, but Jesus told them not to tell others what had happened. And that's Luke chapter eight. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, so I was just going to say, sometimes I think it's easier for people who like have experienced a miracle to effectively witness to other people. So like when you said he tells this guy to like, go be an evangelist for me, mm -hmm. um, I feel like it would be easier for me to be an evangelist if okay so i know like forgiveness of sins is miraculous right but if something like miraculous had happened to me yeah like, you I always mean, you often tell about that's the thing people don't generally tell others about concepts as much as they tell others about experiences yeah like this is which even as i'm saying it i'm like aid you can there are probably many things that you can huh. the lord has healed you from or delivered you from um which is true but if you know do you know what i'm saying yes if I had, like something big so those yes. are the people that have the best testimonies are like people who um yeah god did deliver them from something great almost miraculous think think about it like this though okay so this guy was demonized mm -hmm. so he's got demons around him that are causing all sorts of other terrible symptoms yeah. like we're told he's violent mm -hmm. um for all we know he was a drunk whatever I, I think about the people that I know who have recovered from massive addictions, mm -hmm. and you obviously know some too, and their testimonies tend to be the most compelling. Right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, mm -hmm. but you know, are those miracles or aren't those miracles or I don't know, but I know it's God's doing yeah. either way, whether, mm -hmm. they, whether or not it constitutes technically as a miracle. Yeah, no, yes. So it, it just goes back to yesterday when you were talking about like people not realizing the depth of their sinfulness. Mm -hmm. You know, like I probably wouldn't be saying I haven't been miraculously right. delivered from anything if I actually realized the depth and um, result of my own sinfulness. Sure. Yeah, I think that's true too. The more you get emboldened to talk about like your own weaknesses, mm -hmm. I think that improves your testimony to the world too. I, I've been amazed that, um, so my my psych disorder or mental health or obsessive compulsive disorder is, is uh, you know, probably a combination of different factors. Mm -hmm. But the more open I've become about it and the more I've told people how faith, I've used faith to manage it, uh -huh. that is probably what's resonated with what I've, shared with people as much or more than anything. Mm -hmm. And so it's just this fa that fascinating concept in Christianity that when you actually do kind of lean into be exposing your weaknesses, mm -hmm. understanding that the one perfect thing in your life is your savior and how he's helped you through them, that resonates with mm -hmm. people. Um, um, all right, a couple uh, devotional thoughts for the day then. I, I don't know if I've touched, explained this in these lessons before, not in the last 180 episodes, but uh, parable. What exactly is a parable? What would be, what do you think is either your mm -hmm. or most people's working definition of what a parable is? Because that's just not a word that we use typically. It's a story that tells you, shows you a principle of life. Okay. That's simple working story that teaches you a, a, a principle like of universal, life. universal, yeah, principle of life. But so in some respects, don't all stories, aren't all stories designed to do that? Are they? I've seen a lot of... Um... Christopher Nolan movies. I'm pretty sure that's <laughs> See, not teaching you and, anyone anything. Well, you and I differ on mm -hmm. Mr. Nolan. But um, I think, I mean, I, I would say to me, mm -hmm. granted, I, to even constitute as a story, it has to have a, a theme and a meaning. Really? I talk to you all the time and you just you <laughs> describe it as telling stories. Yeah. But, well, they, they often have a point. Um, <laughs> but the I would say it... The, the one I heard growing up, I think, was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Oh, Did you ever hear that? Fancy. Yeah, but that even that I don't know is that's not comprehensive enough for me. The because okay, so I, I tend to think that there's two errors that people fall into with mm -hmm. parables. Um, one is so there was this problem in the Middle Ages with an interpretation of scripture called allegorizing. Mm -hmm. Allegories, if you remember in your high school 
literature classes where you maybe studied Moby Dick or the Scarlet Letter or something like that. Allegories are where everything in the story, like there's a narrative, mm -hmm. but everything represents something else. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, there's hype, twisting a biblical story or a, specifically a parable. Um, see, allegorizing, the, the problem with it was that people, Bible teachers, were doing it with everything in Scripture. Mm -hmm. um, but parables, like even doing it with parables, when you twist it into mean something that you want it to mean, mm -hmm. that is like a hyper complexity that is too much. Yeah, It's just your spin. The flip side of it is I've heard stories taught almost too simplistically like parables uh i pre recently preached on the good samaritan and i can't tell you how many times i've heard that preached from a standpoint of like okay this is how you treat a neighbor mm -hmm. like that's it's just a moral it's just yeah. the moral of the story and i'm like no jesus isn't just teaching believers to be more moral uh if you can't identify that in that parable you're the dead you're the guy who's dying alongside the road and jesus is the one who comes from afar from down from above samaria is above mm -hmm. uh, uh judea and he's the one that comes from a far off land who's different than us but shows compassion on us at great cost to himself uh and is going to come back and you know like if you can't identify that jesus is the good samaritan and we're the guys alongside the road you haven't taught the parable accurately you haven't taught the parable mm -hmm. in other words there's sometimes a watering down or a dumbing down of parables that is way too simplistic than jesus intends them to be and the fear again it's a reaction to allegorizing but there is this guy uh, a scholar um, named Euliker in the 1800s who started pushing this thing called the Tertium Comparationes, which is the point of comparison. Mm -hmm. um, and it basically is saying there's only one point of comparison in a parable. Well, that's not true because just in this text, we looked at Jesus teaching the parable of the uh, soils. And he very he goes on to explain, he doesn't explain all of his parables. Mm -hmm. But this one, he actually explains what the parable means to his disciples. And he says, and the good soil represents this, and the thorny soil represents this, and the uh, rocky soil represents this, and the hard soil represents this. So right there, he himself is saying there's multiple points of comparison. Mm -hmm. So that is not a good enough definition for me of what a parable is. What I've come to learn, and I, I haven't read this anywhere, but I, I feel strongly about it nonetheless. Uh High school geometry, parabola. Mm -hmm. What is a parabola? It's the exact same root word as parable. A parabola is a, an arch that has equal, uh, equidistant plotted points uh, that are mirrored on an axis of symmetry. So what is a parable? It's the same thing. If it's, it's a story arc, but there's an axis of symmetry. And Jesus teaches it so that, sorry, people on the screen can't see. Jesus teaches it so that the first half of the ark is seen by everybody. He uses an earthly example, like a, something agricultural, mm -hmm. that everybody in that day, whether you're a believer or not a believer, you would have understood it. Mm -hmm. But the mirrored uh, plotted points on the other side of the ark, on the other side of the axis of symmetry that forms a different ark, is, is only those who uh, have the spirit of God and who have faith can actually understand it. So there's one major theme that is being taught, but there are multiple plotted points mm -hmm. that have points of comparison between the two. And um, all I'm saying is I have been greatly, I, I, don't, I don't mean to sound like condescending or, or arrogant about this because I don't know any, all of it about it, all of this stuff either. But I've been really dissatisfied as I've gone on in my understanding of parables, in, in my the way I've heard parables taught. Well, even, and sometimes I feel like it's not necessarily even the, I mean, yes, it is the fault of the teacher, but they're getting that commentary from somewhere. Even the fact that the Bible, um, the subtitle of the, Miss, yeah. the parable. Um, prodigal son. The prodigal son. Yeah. Um, when, when it's supposed to be called two sons or whatever. There, yes. there were two sons. Yeah. It starts, there were two sons, and yet it's called the prodigal son, and you completely lose sight of the elder who, brother. Yeah, who the elder brother is in the story. Yeah, it, which just goes to show that that, that parable... Right, because the story's not about how forgiving the father is. It's about how um, self-righteous and unforgiving the older son was. Yeah. But also how forgiving the father was. Well, no, yeah, it's a, it's about how forgiving the father is, but it's not just about the waywardness of the, the younger mm -hmm. brother. It's just as much about the self-righteousness of the older brother. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Tim Keller's Prodigal God is the, like, you got to read it at some point. It's it's too good not to. But he exposes the fact, like, as you mentioned, that the, the, the section headings in our Bible sometimes aren't great. Mm-hmm. And what that indicates is, like, generations of, like, scholars missed it. Mm-hmm. And I think when it comes to the parables, um, I've heard, well... I'll get into it. That would be that would be a great book if somebody wants to write that though. Parables reimagined through the lens of not just morals that you're supposed to learn, mm-hmm. but through Jesus as the the grace of Jesus in those parables. Why don't you write it? Well, you have a lot of free time. That's that's true. I'm not doing anything else. So uh, yeah, I'll get around to it. Um, all right. So there's the parable. Think of parabola. Go back and. Remember, it's the same concept. Study, if you can define parabola, then you can define what Jesus intends parables Mm -hmm. to mean. Uh, Second devotional thought is the four types of soil. This, man, this always threw me. Um, I mean, you've heard this parable before. Are Mm -hmm. you able in your head to separate what the different types of soil mean? Well, the commentary in my Bible tells me what the different types are. And then it says, um, which type are you? I'm like, I don't know that most people can identify it. That's probably part of the problem. So how do, so can you share what, the, what it yes. identifies? Rocky soil people are people that follow Jesus, believed his message, but never got around to doing anything about it. Okay. Thorny people are overcome by the worries and the lure of materialism, and they leave no room in their lives for God. Okay. Footpath people, like many of the religious leaders, just refuse to believe God's message. Okay. And then good soil people, in contrast to all the other groups, follow Jesus no matter the cost. Hmm. I'm not sure that's, I mean, uh, who am I to critique? I'm not sure that's how I would categorize it exactly. I, so Jesus does explain. This is, in some respects, this parable is about parables. Mm-hmm. Because we don't get other parables where Jesus, he specifically goes out of his way to say, I teach like this. So that some some truths are hidden from the wise, learned, and proud, but so that those who are humble, repentant, and have faith can see what the kingdom is all about. Mm-hmm. So he tells us, like, it's not just a parable about uh, faith transmission. It's a parable about parables. So that's that's fascinating in its own right. Um, but the the rock, the path, the first of the four, very clearly, this uh, the a bird comes and takes it away. Satan comes and takes it away. It never actually sinks in. There are some people that you proclaim the gospel to, mm-hmm. and immediately it's gone. You're like, no, I'm not listening to that. That's different from the rocky soil, where so there's rocks in the soil, which means that it can't ever actually develop a root, or at least a significant mm-hmm. root. And what that means is above the surface of the ground, so like a, a plant is growing up, but it doesn't have a very deep root. And whenever the conditions up here are bad, it immediately falls over mm-hmm. and gets knocked over because it doesn't have anything holding it down. It, there's no significant faith root. And so inevitably, when circumstances in life come blowing hard, their faith gets torn away. So these are people that uh, they respond to the gospel well at first. There's emotional excitement. There's zeal and enthusiasm. But when life happens, mm-hmm. they fly away. The third soil, the thorny soil, is the one I think most longtime believers fall into. So there's a deep root. So the, the rocky soil has roots like this, but the, de- the, the thorny soil has roots down like this, mm-hmm. like really deep. So the, the, it's holding on tight. The problem is there's thorns, and thorns aren't rocks in that. Thorns are alive, and they're active, and they're, they pull the same resources. They try to pull water. Mm-hmm. Like thorns... Um, and weeds pull water just like plants do. And so it's things in your life that even though you have strong uh, faith, they compete with that faith. Mm -hmm. So another word for that is idols. So the things in your life, so you might be a Christian um, your whole life and you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But what really you really think defines you in your life is the health and wellness of your family. Mm-hmm. Or what you really think defines you in life is your physical attractiveness or your intelligence or your wins and personality or your successful career or uh, your comfort and pleasure. The thing that you think you need to have to make you you, that is a thorn that sticks down in the soil mm-hmm. that is pulling as much of your resource, the resources in your life, as the faith actually is. Mm-hmm. Okay, And it's choking it. So that is the thing. 
the distinction between those two soils, the rocky soil and the thorny soil, is one that for years I just I read it a thousand times and I'm like, I don't know what the difference between these two is. Mm -hmm. The rocky soil is people who have no little root and get pulled away by life's uh, struggles. The thorny soil is people who are true believers, but nonetheless have idols in their life that are competing for their time, talents, treasures, and heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the good soil, of course, is those whose the root is deep. Uh, the thorns are getting pulled regularly through repentance, repentance of our idols, and therefore it's bear, bearing fruit in our lives. Mm -hmm. All right. I always thought it was, even though Jesus explains it, I always thought it was such a challenging parable that I thought it was worth spending some time on. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, devotion, I was going to say devotional thought four because I spent so much time on that one. Uh, devotional thought three then is using your faith. And this is just a, the section where Jesus and the disciples are out at sea. So like, we're not even going to get into the second half of this. Jairus's daughter and, uh, demon possessed guy. Uh, like there's so much here that's worth studying, but when you limit ourselves to 20, 25 minutes, we just can't. Um, but Jesus calming the storm. So Jesus always goes through these periods of teaching and then testing. Mm -hmm. And he teaches disciples during the day and then like at night, let's push out to sea and cross. Let's just cross the lake. Let's just see what happens. And a squall sets down over the Sea of Galilee as was happened, you know, happened to uh, be the case often. And that teaching and testing is often juxtaposed um, in the Bible with Jesus and his disciples, which it, it is in our lives too. Uh, you can learn here in a classroom, but then you go out into life and that faith gets tested. And so what ends up happening is the squall comes, Jesus is asleep under the deck, the disciples freak out mm -hmm. and they say, what are you doing? We're going to die up here. Jesus gets up, he rebukes the wind of the waves and he turns to them and says, where is your faith? I think, but weren't they, I feel like they were showing their faith in Jesus' ability and who he was by waking him up to now, do something about it. Yes. Like only he can do something about it. So yes and no. And you're right. It's not just this binary, do they have faith or don't they mm -hmm. have faith? And it's interesting that he doesn't say you don't have faith. He mm -hmm. says, where is your faith? He knows they have faith. They're just not using it. And that's the problem. So, and they run to a master, master, we're going to drown. And that is like such a, this is every Christian, right? Because mm -hmm. you can properly identify Jesus Christ as the master of your life. You're calling out to him in your life. You're praying to him, but you're so negative mm -hmm. and you're like, we're going to drown. Like you're telling him what's going on in your life as opposed to letting him be the master and tell you what's going to happen in your life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there's this contradiction in terms to turn to the master of the universe, call him master and say, this is what's going to happen. You know, like, no, he's the master. He determines what's going to happen. And so when he says to him, it's not, you don't have any faith. He says, you're not using your faith. He's not calling them not Christians. He's saying, you're not using the resources that I've given you to navigate through the storms of life. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's Christians. That's what Christian counseling is about. That's what, you know, um, growth. It, and I think, you know, what area of your life, I'm saying you out there and, you know, us here, what area of your life are you struggling to apply faith to? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. And where Jesus would say to you, where is your faith? It doesn't mean he's not saying you're not a Christian. He's saying you're not using all the resources that I've given you to get through this difficulty. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't know if I, I'm thinking for myself right now of examples. Um, and I don't know if you have any examples of like, okay, Jesus would be looking in this, in this storm of life right now. Jesus would be looking at me and saying, come on, aid, where's your faith? Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, I'm constantly stressed out. <laughs> you are constantly stressed out right now. And why? Uh -huh. Yeah, because I'm just trying to finish my program. Yeah. And um, so what would, if Jesus says, where is your faith? What would he? Well, yesterday I said, if God leads you to it, he's got to get you through it. And you said, that's not accurate. Well, you were saying like, I don't like when you use little cliches to tell say exactly what God is going to do. You know, you know, I'm prickly about that. I was like, well, he's gotten me this far. Mm -hmm. I'll have to finish. And you were like, that doesn't have to happen. Like, that's not guaranteed to happen. Yeah. Well, don't say master, master, I'm going to drown. Or master, master, I'm going to complete this course. Or master, ma you know, like you let him be the master if you're going to What call am him I master. supposed to say then? Please, if it be your will, let this mm -hmm. happen. 
please bless me, help me to do my best, help me to stay humble, help me to work hard, uh, but whatever may be to your glory. If that's the whole Jesus says, you know, not my will, but yours be done thing, mm -hmm. right? So like, if you don't know, if he hasn't told you exactly what's going to happen, then that's got to be the disposition. I feel like he told me by putting me in the program. Well, that, I mean, I know it's a easily cited example, but Job's whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like Job easily could have said like, well, but God, you clearly, you know, you took my health away from me. You took my land away from mm -hmm. me and my wealth. You took my family away from me. Um, you, you know, I thought you wouldn't have given them to me if you didn't want me to be blessed through them. Yeah, that's true. You know, like, so it's, it's God's to give and it's mm -hmm. God's to take away. And it's not our, at the end of the day, God says, Job, where were you when I stretched out the stars in the sky? You don't mm -hmm. know why I do what I do, but just it's, that's arrogant to think that you would know, mm -hmm. you know, cause you're not God. You don't see everything as clearly as I do. So I think whenever, I think stress, you mentioned stress. I, I think that's probably the best indicator mm -hmm. because the storms of life, circumstances are the things that cause stress in our lives. And so for some of us, it's finances right now, obviously during pandemic year, there's health stuff. Um, is my is my job gonna be around uh, a year from now? Is my whatever? And um, just be careful when you cry out, master, master, I'm drowning. Mm -hmm. Like, no, master, master, you can be the master. Here's what it feels like right now, and here's what I'm asking for, but you are the master and you know what's gonna happen. You can, you can calm this, you can end this, you can cure my, servant you can whatever you mm -hmm. know so other aspects of using uh how christians i know i often use the analogy of downloading something onto your computer but mm -hmm. not installing it yeah uh th that's the only like modern tech uh example that always comes to mind for me but i've i've failed to do that so many times mm -hmm. that it's become for me a very clear illustration of not using like knowing the gospel but not using the gospel in my life you know all right. Any final thoughts? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's close with prayer then. Heavenly Father, uh, whatever storms that we or our study participants at home today might be going through, we ask that uh, we trust that you're in control. Uh, it's hard when all of our senses tell us, you know, the, the boat's going to tip over and we're going to drown. Um, but if we're calling out to you and calling you master, then we should have more faith. Uh, and we should use our faith. And we ask that you forgive us for the times in life where we're not using our faith or we haven't used it well. And we're also asking that moving forward, it's not our job to control the wind and the waves. We're not asking you to take away all the storms. We're asking you to help us have, to use our faith whenever we face those storms and that it may glorify you. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks again for studying with us. We'll see you next time for Luke chapter nine.